if something happens, like um, a chopper comes down on your thigh and you've got, you know, you've got blood and you've got all of that, and you think, hell, what have I done? Mm -hmm. Now, what the brain, look, you, you look at it with yep. your eyes, you see a gaping wound and you see blood coming out. So what is your brain now thinking? Jeepers, I, I don't know. But what could your brain be thinking? Mm. What could it be evaluating? Uh, anything you can think of that's relevant, ranging from... If the brain is saying, I know this is a little bit dualistic, but if the brain says, the best thing for Margaret now is to be in a lot of pain, that'll alert her attention and someone will come over and help her, then it will probably hurt. If the brain concludes, which is often the case in severe injury, if the brain concludes, actually, to make this really hurt now will not serve my purpose because I need to get to the hospital, for example. And if I concentrate on producing pain, that will stop Margaret in her tracks. She won't move. She'll yell out. She'll scream. And, and we won't solve the problem. So th there's a really bizarre relationship at, at hospitals, if you like. The worst injuries that come in the door are often the least painful. And the more minor injuries are more painful. Unbelievable. Yeah, I, and I, I didn't believe that when I was a student. And my professor said that. So... I went and did the experiment at Royal North Shore Hospital and I remember a fellow that came in with a hammer stuck in his neck. What? And he was he was completely coherent, no fuss, no pain at all. I said, mate, you've got a hammer in your neck. Uh, and he said, yeah, I know. And he jumped up and down and the hammer's going wobbly. He's got blood all over his shirt. Well, his brain was perceiving danger, surely. Uh, his brain was choosing not to make his neck hurt. For, so that he could, so that he could know that he was going to get proper treatment. I guess so. I mean, I'd find that very difficult to interpret because he actually turned around, hit his knee on a coffee table, <laughs> and was he was having a bad day. He, he was <laughs> well. He was in hysterics because of his knee, and the nurse came over and said, "My God, look at your neck!" And he he was jumping up and down, saying, "It's my knee, you idiot! It's my but knee." But when they got the hammer out of his neck, presumably he started to experience pain. Presumably, or started the, to report pain. Yeah, I mean the. The next stage in that is that once people get behind the curtains into care, often their pain really comes on strong. It's something that I suppose doctors have to understand acutely, don't they? Mm, absolutely. Yeah. What about chronic pain when people suffer real pain? Yeah, well, there's, there's really good data now about how many people do um, and the, the people at North Shore Hospital have done great work. Fiona Blythe led that where... Really, in a in a fantastic study, one in five Australians has some sort of chronic pain that affects their life. And it's mostly in the back, is it? Back pain is the most common of those, mm -hmm. yeah. And it's very costly. It costs Australia $35 billion a year. And there is a push led by Michael Cousins at North Shore to really get this into the eyesight of, of the decision makers. What are you saying about this then? If, if, as we've been talking about, pain is the body, the brain fearing nice. and all of that and yeah. you know registering it when chronic pain is there it's all the time the brain's yeah. saying is is the brain saying uh, my, my back is in danger in some way yeah i think it is yes and the thing that happens in the nervous system if the nervous system or if one neuron does something a lot it gets better at doing that thing and we know that from learning that's how we learn skills and if you imagine that in order to have pain, your danger system in your, in your spinal cord and then the network of neurons that, that are responsible for producing your back pain keep firing together. They just keep working, bang, 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 bang. Then they just get very good at doing that uh, so that the triggers to set off that pain become more and more... Efficient. Yeah, absolutely efficient. Yeah, and the the story that I tell um, patients is just to imagine that the brain is like an orchestra, uh, which in in some ways it is. Lots of instruments that produce tunes, and one of the tunes that the brain can produce is your back pain, for example. And if that orchestra just plays the back pain tune over and over and over and over and over, then it just gets better at playing until you can play in your sleep. Until you're not saying people are imagining back pain, are you? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And that's the real, you know, this is, I said in, in that little break, that I sometimes get anxious that I won't get the point across. But what what I feel really strongly about is that we can, in complete honesty, say to patients with back pain, we see nothing wrong in your back. And, you know, there's lots of back pain patients with things wrong in their back. But even when we don't have positive findings on MRIs and CAT scans and things like that, 
because pain is a protective device produced by your brain, we can be completely confident in saying, I know you have back pain and it's horrible. Just because we can't see this thing in the back doesn't mean your back pain is any less back pain-y. It's exactly the same. You're not imagining anything. It's real. And, you know, they know they're not imagining it. And it really annoys me when I when I hear from patients that someone, often a, a, a clinician, has said to them, look, there's nothing wrong in your back. Just cheer up and get on with it. And take a Panadol or something. Yeah, I mean, that's just, in my mind, biologically indefensible. What statement. about people who've got slipped discs i'm putting that in in air, air inverted commas yeah. slipped discs yeah. or bulging discs or des- desiccated discs you hear yep. all these dreadful things that can happen to discs oh you the language of disc injuries is just ridiculous isn't it that we say we've sprained our ankle or strained our leg muscle but we herniate discs and we don't so if if you ever had the chance to look at what a disc looks like you cannot slip it it can't move there. It's wedged in, it's all attached with all sorts Can't of things. Can't people ligaments. show you their x-rays that show that the spinal column is doing this rather than this? Yeah, yeah. So that happens to all of us, unfortunately. Uh, there are, I think, I don't know the exact numbers, but about 40% of people have these obvious changes in their disc, in their intervertebral disc, uh, and have no back pain. And there are a good proportion of people who have back pain who don't have these changes in their in their mm. disc. There's certainly a good argument that that this structure between your vertebra that we call the disc, which is a stupid name for it, but we call it that, uh, can produce danger messages which head to the brain saying there's danger in your back. And we know that it can do that. But we also know that the disc is made of ligaments surrounding a, a, this sort of gelatinous core that becomes less gelatinous as you get old. But the ligaments on the outside... Uh, just like the ligaments in your ankle. You twist your ankle, you tear a ligament, you and it gets better. If you tear a ligament in your back, just a little tear, all of a sudden we use this catastrophic language and we, we have this view of the back as though it's this really vulnerable thing. Uh, and we have these radical treatment options for people, even though at a cellular level the injury is really similar. That's interesting. Yeah. What about somebody who's got a chronic knee problem and every time they go for a run, it, oh, it hurts down the left-hand side or the right-hand side or the front of the knee or something. Yeah. They go off to the knee bloke and the knee bloke says, you know, we're going to do a reconstruction here. That's because they're in pain and it's making them hobble. Yeah, and, and that's where a good clinician needs a really tight clinical reasoning uh, in order to make that decision because... Absolutely, these danger receptors that are spread over our body are are the key informants to our brain. We have to then look at the behaviour of the pain and think, okay, well, if you if your knee hurts whenever you run at that part of your your running cycle, uh, and then you do a physical assessment and you can you have your findings that are consistent with that, then you can start to say, okay, well, I think there's a tissue in that part of your knee that is the contributor that's getting inflamed and inflammation causes pain is that right yeah inflammation makes danger receptors more sensitive